Matthew 23, 13 through 15. And the King James text today reads, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Boy, I'm telling you, if the Lord ever spoke a powerful rebuke, that is a powerful rebuke. But there's a lot more to say in this vein than we're reading today. I'm going to talk to us for a while on the topic. The perils of religious spirits. The perils of religious spirits. Will you bow your heads with me one more time? Father, once again, God, we love you. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come and to receive from the word of the Lord. Master, today this is a powerful document that you have placed in our care. It is able, Lord, not only to build up, not only to create from nothing something wonderful and something glorious, but it is also able to destroy and to tear down. Master, in the name of Jesus, loose the anointing of the Holy Ghost today upon the messenger of God. Allow me to speak boldly, plainly, clearly in love for the benefit of God's people today. Let the love of God shine through all that I say. Let nothing be spoken in malice or anger or hurt. Master, today use me. Touch the ear of every hearer. For we need to hear from heaven this hour. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. The perils of religious spirits. The Lord rebukes the scribes and Pharisees. He labels them hypocrites. He says that they're not even interested in entering the kingdom of God. Isn't that funny that there'd be people who are in the church, there'd be people who are in religion, and they're not even interested in entering into the kingdom of God. And not only are they not interested in entering in, but they're there as well to hinder those who might have a desire to do so. You see, a lot of people, Tommy, believe that demons are these ugly little creatures that present themselves with fangs and blood dripping from their fingernails, and they're these awful, terrible things, you know, and that they run around possessing people and forcing people, making people do wicked, evil, horrible things. A lot of Pentecostals have this kind of a view of demons and the work of demons, what they don't understand is that demons, number one, folks, are real. Do not kid yourself for a moment. Do not for one minute think that dark powers and dark spirits uh, in the employ of our enemy Satan, do not think for a moment that they do not exist. They do in fact exist. There is no question about this. The Word of God tells us that God created good and God created evil. Now a lot of people, when they read that in the Word of God, it chokes them. They're, they're like, well, no, that can't be possible. God didn't, he didn't create evil. Well, yes, he did. Because the same God who created light also created dark. Sure. 
You can't have one extreme and not have the opposite extreme. Adam could not have been placed in the Garden of Eden with the choice to make between good and evil if evil did not exist. Hello now. Mm -hmm. Now the tree, I'm told, the tree that Adam was told to leave alone was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Many people want to believe that, and I've taught on this when I taught on spiritual warfare. Those of you who've been in our church now for a good while, you remember the series we did on spiritual warfare called Paranormal 101. That series has received more viewers in the years that it's been on our YouTube channel. If you go to our YouTube channel and you look at our uh, playlists, you'll find the Paranormal 101 playlist for 23 or 26 weeks. We covered everything identifying as paranormal and what it really is from a biblical Christian perspective and how to handle these things from a biblical Christian perspective. A lot of people think demons are these terrible little ogres, you know, these horrible, hideous beasts that run around growling and snarling and being scary. And, and what they don't understand is that's not how demon, demons work. Demons work in the realms of influence. Their purpose is not so much to make you do something as to influence you to do something. Okay? They want to whisper in your ear, as it were, things that will cause you to question the Word of God or to take a path or make a decision that is contrary to the counsel of God's Word. This is why Christians must be doubly careful that in every circumstance, in every situation that we come across in this life, that we be mindful to respond to that situation in a biblical, Christian, godly manner. By doing so, we cut the devil off at the pass. And his little imps, his demons, are not going to find a door open to influence us to the negative. The Word of God said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Demons operate, as does Satan himself, in the realms of destruction. They operate in the realms of thievery. What does that mean? That means they want to take something from you that you've been able to lay your hands on. If you've got the peace of God in your life, they want to steal the peace. They don't want you to have that peace. If you've got the joy of the Holy Ghost, they don't want you to have the joy of the Holy Ghost. If you've got victory over sin, over uh, some form of addiction or something of this nature, they don't want you to have victory over sin and over addiction and all this. So they're going to do everything in their power to influence you in such a manner so as to steal that away from you, to steal your victory, to steal your joy, to steal your peace. All the things that Jesus promised us we would have as children of God. Am I telling the truth? That's what demons are there for. They're there, they are there, if possible, to bring you to a point of self-destruction. Mm -hmm. You see, a demon doesn't just pop up on the scene and vaporize you, cause you to burn up and be gone. No, no, no. Demons are looking to encourage you and motivate you and inspire you to destroy yourself. The Word of God said, There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is what? Destruction. So if the enemy can convince you to take your own path and to follow your own advice and to follow your own thinking and your own logic, he knows that the end of that journey is going to be destruction. Nothing good is going to come out of that. Well, I've got news for you folks. Demons operate as much, if not more, in the church than they do out of the church. Huh. 
Who are you going to steal from if not the people of God who have things that you don't want them to have? You don't want them to have the things that God has promised. You don't want them to have blessing. You don't want them to have healing. You don't want them to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You don't want them to have victory over sin. You don't want them to have the joy of the Lord. You don't want them to have the peace of God that passeth all understanding. Well, you're not going to go out in the world and steal from people because you already got them people. Those people are already on the path to destruction. Why in the world be bothered with them? No, demons aren't interested in the world. The, the world's in their pocket. They're interested in the people of God. And as people of God, we must be aware, we must be careful, we must be mindful. Now, I want to insert here real quick. I'm not going to be like a lot of these preachers, and I'm not trying to be mean today, but y'all, anybody who knows me knows the only way I know how to talk is plain. <sighs> A lot of your African Christians, Christians coming out of the African continent, they have some convoluted and blown up crazy teaching, folks. I'm going to tell you right now. I've had some debates and conversations with uh, some believers who came from Africa, and, and the stuff they're taught down there, the, the teaching is terrible. It is so off base. I do not want you to think that as a child of God, you need to be fearful of a demon behind every tree, okay? That's not what I'm saying. But you see, demons can only come into your life. They can only begin to exercise influence in your life when you offer them an invitation. You see, a demon cannot just move in. That's not how it works. Just like the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God doesn't just come in uninvited either. Amen. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will answer and do what? And will let him in. said, If you'll let me in, I'll come in and I'll dine with you. Isn't that what he said? I'll sup with you. But it requires an invitation. It requires an open heart. It requires an open door. And many believers will do things that they oftentimes don't even realize leaves the door ajar. Mm -hmm. It's like leaving a door at your house unattended. You open the door a little bit, then you get distracted. It's, oh, I meant to get this or I meant to get And you go back to get it. Well, while you do so, your door is left wide open. And the enemy sees that open door and says, Aha, now I have an opportunity to come in. So as children of God, we don't need to be worried about a demon behind every tree. But what we do need to be concerned with is living our lives in such a way that we do not ever open a door to demonic influence. When you give yourself permission to be vengeful, or to be angry, mm -hmm. you're opening a door to a demon. Say, well, how, how does that work, Pastor? I'll tell you how it works. When you give yourself permission to embrace something that God says you ought not to embrace, then you are no longer believing the Word of God, and you're trusting in your own logic, your own thinking. What is the end of a way that seemeth right unto man? Destruction. So you've got to be careful. A lot of people give themselves permission to live in a state of bitterness. They give themselves permission to live in a state of pain or hurt. Say pain? You mean the enemy can use pain as an entrance? Well, oh yes he can. Oh yes he can. Matter of fact, that's probably one of the most common entries the enemy uses. The pastor that I served my internship under in the Church of God, Brother Carver, told me once about a lady that uh, was in his church, and she had been involved in a very serious car wreck. And she had hurt herself pretty badly and uh, was in a lot of pain, obviously, and what have you. And she went through a long period of time where she just struggled with pain and struggled with pain and struggled with it. And 
He said, after quite a while, he said, one day I went to her house and I was just there to check on her, she and her husband and to visit with them. And he said, and I was sitting in the living room talking to them. He said, all of a sudden her countenance changed. Her entire countenance changed. Said her face, the expression on her face changed. Said she became very angry and very bitter and very mean. And he said, all of a sudden she stood up from her chair and she started coming at Brother Carver like he, she's going to choke him. And he knew immediately what was going on. He said, devil, sit down in Jesus' name. And he said, Chuck, i tell you right now, he said, I'm not kidding. He said, that woman flew back. He said, it was like watching a movie. He said, that woman looked like an angel of God, pushed her backward. And she literally just flung back into her seat. He said, I stood up and I went over to her and I laid my hands on her and I began to rebuke the devil somewhere, somehow. Somewhere, somehow, this lady had allowed a door to open that gave these demons influence. Well, if you give them enough influence, you no longer allow them to influence, you allow them to drive. Tommy drives me crazy. The other day we were driving, I, I about, well, I'm telling you, I was about to have a fit. He loves it when I share these stories. He's back there just smiling away because he loves it when I share these stories. I don't know what happened to him the other day. I said, what did you do? Take some kind of pill or something that's got you just paranoid and crazy or what? I'm driving and he is just screeching and hollering every little thing. Oh, watch out for this. And he just is a nervous wreck. And I said, what in the world is going on with you? You are driving me insane. He, I mean, it was crazy. He, he can be a little bit backseat driverish, but this day he was just super backstreet driverish, you know? Well, sometimes the enemy, when the enemy is backseat driving and he's trying to influence you, watch out for this, look at that, you know, and he's trying to influence you. If you're not careful, you'll give him the wheel. You say, you know what, you're driving me crazy. Why don't you just drive? Now we have what is commonly referred to as possession. And now that spirit, listen to me now children, I, I, this is more teaching than preaching again I guess. A demon never possesses you. You possess a demon. When a person has a demon, the demon is not in possession of you. You are in possession of a demon. Do you follow what I'm telling you? That demon never owns you. That demon has no right to you. That demon, no matter whether you're a believer or not a believer, that demon is a trespasser. Okay? It's like having a big old dog roaming around the neighborhood and you open the door to your house and all of a sudden that dog comes wandering in and sits down on the rug and your living room starts watching your TV. Just because he comes in and makes himself at home doesn't mean he belongs here. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Same thing is true of demons. When we allow them to influence us enough, and, we, and many times we get comfortable with that spirit, this is one reason why preachers, and, and I see the mistake made constantly, I see preachers making this mistake. First of all, you've got preachers don't believe in demons, don't believe in demon possession, don't believe in, in deliverance. Then you got the others who think that just because they shout and scream the name of Jesus at a demon, that it's going to lead, bless God, and oh, I've cured the ills of the world. No, you have not. Because if the person that you cast the demon out of does not shut the door behind them and nail it shut, they'll be back, and they're going to come back worse. So this is why I've had preachers and uh, preachers, people in our church, 
who are accustomed to the old-fashioned way of doing business, and they come to brother to Pastor Charles, and they don't understand why Brother Charles just don't cast that demon out of that person. I've discerned there's a demon there. Why don't you just cast it out of that person? Well, it's easy because that person's not ready to be delivered from that demon. Till that person is ready to be delivered, until that person will not be happy unless they are delivered, and unless that person comes to the place where they are prepared to maintain and retain their deliverance, it would be pure stupidity on my part to cast the demon out of them. All I'm going to do is cause them to leave this place and God only knows it can be days later. I've seen it happen with situations. Months later, boom, they're, they're right back and they're worse than they were to start with. You've got to be very careful. This is why the Apostle Paul, when he and uh, Silas were preaching, and you remember the Bible tells us there was a woman, a witch, who was following them and saying, oh, these men are telling the truth. These men are preaching the truth. And the Bible said that she did this for several days. Finally, after several days, Paul looked at her and he rebuked the demon and he cast the demon out of her. Well, the question is, why didn't Paul do that from day one? It's very easy. Because only a foolish person casts demons out without the direction and guidance of the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost to inform you as to the timing. Just like people, again, I'm going to use the, the godly opposite, people receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. There are times when people are ripe. And they are ready to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They are, they're, they're like a balloon full of water. They're just about to pop. They can't stretch anymore. They are ready to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And God knows it. And oftentimes what the Lord will do is he'll send somebody over to them like happened with me on more accounts, more times than I can mention. But he'll speak to me and say, go lay hands on that person. And I'll go over and I'll lay my hands on them and say, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I, that's all I got to say. I don't say fill them with the Holy Ghost. I don't say heal them. I don't say tickle them with a the feather. I don't say nothing. I just say in the name of Jesus. And when I do, poof. The Holy Ghost fills them. Because they were ready. They were right. They just needed some divine act. They needed God to do something to show. And many times people will ask the Lord, Oh Lord, I, I want the Holy Ghost so bad. I want the Holy Ghost. Just, just ask that preacher, Lord, tell that preacher to come lay hands on me. I've heard of people doing this. And then lo and behold, here they come. You see what I'm saying? So you have to be ripe. You have to be ready to receive the Holy Ghost. You have to get all your ducks in a row. Doesn't mean you have to live perfect, be perfect. But what I mean by that is you've got to be in a mindset and in a place of complete and total surrender. You've got to be able and willing to surrender to the Lord and let God have His way and let God rule and reign in your life in a way that you've never experienced before. And believe it or not, that scares a lot of people. A lot of people are afraid of that. They're, well, what's God going to make me do? Well, well he's going to make you jump off a cliff and kill you. So, no, he's not. <laughs> but, you know, people, because they've never experienced it, because they're not familiar, this is why in church services, uh, believers share their testimonies and share their stories. Because in the process of that, we're helping the other believers who haven't gotten to where we are yet to understand the journey and to understand the process. Do you understand what I'm saying? And it helps a lot of times. Sometimes people say, you know, when sister so-and-so shared her testimony of how she received the Holy Ghost, that really spoke to me and that really helped me to understand, you know? And, well, the same is true when it comes to evicting spirits that have taken up residence. You've got to wait on God's time. You've got to let the Lord direct you and guide you. You see, all the while that witch was following Paul and Silas, not only were they hearing her loud mouth, amen, and everything they preached, but listen to me now, but she was hearing everything they were preaching. <laughs> that truth was getting into her. That 
that news of the gospel was getting into her, and slowly but surely, things must have been happening in her thinking, and things must have been happening in her spirit, and things begin to shift, so that all of a sudden now, after several days, she was ready to be delivered from the spirit that had occupied her life for all that time. All right, I'm not trying to preach on demon possession today, and I've gone way overboard on that, so now i got to try to get back on track. That's just laying some groundwork. Many Christians falsely believe that demonic spirits operate only within the realms of sin and depravity. They assume that all things wicked are inspired by evil influences and spiritual forces have no access to those who embrace faith in God, or more specifically, those who embrace and who have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. But nothing, my dear friend, can be further from the truth. Satan's most ambitious work is not among those whose souls to which he already has a legitimate claim but rather those who pursue some form of religion in an effort to know God and to embrace spiritual things as they relate to the divine. In our primary text today, the Lord refers to the scribes and Pharisees as creating, listen, quote, children of hell. You remember the final verse, verse 15? Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Mm -hmm. So the Lord is simultaneously saying, you're not a child of God, you're a child of hell to the scribes and Pharisees. And he's also saying, and when you create a proselyte, you turn around and make them into a child of hell like yourself. You see, there are spirits in the spirit realm whose specific duty and specific work is within the realms of religion. There are what we refer to as religious spirits. You'll notice in my picture up here, I've got this young lady, and she looks scary. She looks a little spooky, doesn't she? Because she represents a child of hell. Amen. She represents what the Lord said these scribes and Pharisees create, children of hell, and what these scribes and Pharisees are. But there are spirits that operate specifically in the realms of religion in the realms of the religious world. You remember the word of God said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Listen, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Oh, you mean demons operate in the realms of spirituality? Yeah, you better believe they do. You better believe they do. You want to turn people off to the gospel. You want to turn people off to Jesus. Nothing will do it better than taking one of his followers and turning them into a religious fanatic that doesn't act like a Christian is supposed to act, doesn't talk like a Christian is supposed to talk, doesn't love like a Christian is supposed to love, doesn't live like a Christian is supposed to live. Am I telling the truth? Nothing will turn people off and push them away from the gospel more than somebody who calls themselves a child of God, but in reality, they don't act like a child of God. They don't talk like a child of God. They don't do like a child of God ought to do. What happens is religious spirits operate in religious circles. There are denominations in America, there are denominations in our world that are completely consumed by the influence of religious spirits. Demons literally control, the Bible says, the Word of God warns us in the last days, of doctrines of devils. 
Well, how are doctrines of devils going to find their way into the religious community except there's somebody who's got some influence, there's somebody who's higher up in these groups and in these organizations is making themselves available to the influence of demonic powers. A lot of people don't realize, but if you do any research, you'll find out that even the Jehovah's Witness organization, early in its days, they claim that uh, they got their information and they got a lot of their truth from spiritual visitations. Why, the very Bible translation that they used to love to tout as being in line with their translation, the New World Translation, there's a translation that they use. I don't, I'm not sure they, they're bragging about it too much now because it's become known enough. But they used to say, oh, this man's translation is right in keeping with ours. Hallelujah, glory to God. And that shows you that we're not the only ones that translate it this way. Yeah, but the only problem is the translation they're quoting was by a spiritualist. And he claimed that spirits of the dead helped him to translate it in a manner that is perfectly in keeping with what the Jehovah's Witness Bible says. Didn't know that, did you? Oh, there's, look at the Mormons. According to Mormon theology, Joseph Smith was visited by an Italian angel. I say he's an Italian angel because his name was Moroni. And there ain't an angel in the Bible called Moroni. There's not an angel in the Bible by this name. But somehow or another, God decided to use an angel that had a name that is not identified in Scripture. Now, why God would do this, I'll never know. Why wouldn't he send Gabriel like he did in so many other important occasions? After all, he was telling Joseph Smith that all the denominations of the world were wrong. Every one of them was wrong. And I'm going to show you the right way. I'm going to show you the true way. The Apostle Paul said, if anyone come to you preaching any other gospel, any other doctrine than that which you have received of us, said, let him be accursed. He said, if we, meaning the apostles themselves, come to you and preach any other message than you've already heard us preach, let us be accursed. He said, if an angel from heaven. So the Apostle Paul literally laid out. That even if an angel comes and presents another message to you than what you want me, he said, let it be a curse. Well, that's exactly what Mormonism is based on. That's exactly what their doctrine is based on. That this angel appeared out of heaven and showed Joseph Smith that all churches were wrong. Every one of them were wrong. Every one of them were evil and wicked. And that Joseph Smith, that God was using him as a last day's prophet to show the world the right way. Well, folks, you better be careful because demons operate in the realms of religion. In Psalm chapter 51 and verse 10, the writer has penned these words, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You see, we've got to be mindful. We've got to keep ourselves in tune with the Lord. And we have to go to God once in a while and say, Lord, help me clean house. If I've given the enemy uh, any open door, if I've given the enemy any thought that I'm willing to compromise or I'm willing to be self-willed or I'm willing to disbelieve the Word of God, then Lord, help me to eject that devil now so I can get my spirit back on the right track. Amen. 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 In James chapter 1, 19 through 27, the word of God said, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any... 
For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass or in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Speaking plainly and clearly, making this as simple as I can make it for you today, if it quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck and it looks like a duck, it's a duck. If it doesn't, it's not. It's that simple. Too many people look at human beings who identify as Christians, but they don't act like Christians. They do not live according to the teaching and the mandate of the Word of God. Too many people look at them, and, and even Christians, we look at them and we say, oh, they're Christians, they're just not acting right. No, they're not Christians. You cannot be a Christian and not act right. You cannot not act right and be a Christian. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? No. If you're born again the Bible way, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, right. meekness, so on and so forth. The fruit of the Spirit. You don't have to stand there and force fruit to grow on a limb of a tree. That tree doesn't have to work at all to make that fruit grow. No. As long as the tree is healthy, the fruit's going to be there. You know what the problem with most preachers is? You know why so many Pentecostal preachers and Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterian and Episcopalian and you name it, you know why they get up in their pulpit and they preach against this and they preach against that and oh, I'm trying to keep the church clean. I'm trying to help God's people act right. No, you're not. You're trying to get people who have not been born again the way they ought to have been born again to act like they've been born again. Uh-huh. If your church was full of born-again people, if your church had people who didn't just speak in tongues, but people who genuinely had the gift of the Holy Ghost, i got news for you, honey. Uh, you wouldn't have any of them issues in your church. Too many preachers try to preach holiness into their congregations because it isn't there naturally. It isn't there as the byproduct of their love for God. It isn't there as a byproduct of their Christian service. It isn't there as the byproduct of a healthy and grafted life in Christ. If you've been grafted into the tree, sweetheart, the nutrients are coming through. You're going to grow. You're going to bear fruit. It's not about you have to put forth the effort to do these things and to have these things. But I grew up my whole life in church where preachers talk about the fruit of the Spirit. And they'd be talking about it. If, you're not, if you don't have this, you need to work on this. If you don't have that, you need to work on it. Oh, no, no, no. If you don't have these things, you need to get saved. Because when you get saved, those things will naturally begin to manifest themselves. You need to become sincere in your walk with God. You need to lay aside self-will. This is what the writer was telling us in the text that I've just read to you in James chapter 1. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only. We got too many people who are highly insincere when it comes to the word of God. I love when I see these idiotic billboards and posters that say, uh, you know, well-worn Bible. You know, no person, uh, no evil person or whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, no ungodly person has a well-worn Bible. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I know some people you hadn't met then. Oh, I know plenty of people wear their Bible out. They wear that book out. Man, they read it through two, three times a year. And you know what? For all the reading, 
They ain't living half of it. Because again, you don't benefit from the Word of God unless you approach it with the right spirit and the right attitude. If you're not approaching your walk with God sincerely, that's the key word, sincerely. Because the spirits that work in the realms of religion, they will jump on insincerity in a flat second. You not be real about your faith in one little tiny way and those demons will be on you like white on rice and there is one spirit one primary spirit that works in the realms of the church and works in the realms of religion and when i say religion i mean all religion whether you be buddhist or whether you be hindu what have you but there is one spirit that works in the realms of religion that is probably the most powerful and the most influential spirit, and that is the spirit of deception. Cults are controlled by a spirit of deception. That is why when people sell themselves out to a cult, well, what defines a cult? Our leaders are perfect. Everything they say is right. We can't trust anything anybody else says. We can't. Is that what the Word of God said? No, that's not what the Word of God said. The Word of God said that you have no need that any man teach you, but the anointing which you have received of him will teach you all things and is truth and is not a lie. So God says the Holy Ghost will teach you everything you need to know. You don't need a man. You don't need an individual. You don't need an organization. Those things are placed. Uh, God gives those things to the church as a gift. He does give us denominations. He does give us organizations. He does give us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Those are gifts to the church, and they do help us in our journey. But are they required? Do you have to have those things in order to be saved? No, not at all. Do you have to go to Brother Charles' church to be born again, to be saved? No, not at all. When people uh, decide they want to leave our church, all I'm interested in is whether they're going to stay in the one God, Jesus' name, apostolic faith. I could care less where they go to church. Doesn't bother me, Tommy, if they want to go to another church as long as they keep the faith. My concern is that your doctrine stay right and your faith stay right, not what particular church or what particular denomination or what particular organization you belong to because those things are not necessities they're gifts they're there they benefit us in many ways they help us in many ways but they are not essential to salvation the spirit of deception this is what James said concerning reading the word of God and not doing or hearing the Word of God, I'm sorry, and not living it, not doing it. Well, if you're hearing it and you're not doing it, it's very simple. You're not approaching it from a place of sincerity. That's the problem. And what does he say a person who does this does? They deceive their own selves. You literally open the door to a spirit of deception. Let me tell you something. When a spirit of deception has wrecked some blinders on your eyes so that all you can see is the deception. All you can see is what they've convinced you is what you're supposed to see. And you refuse to see anything else. Uh, you're under the influence of a powerful demon. Look at this whole Trump business. Look at this whole Trump cult. Look at everything we've seen. These are all evangelical so-called Bible-believing people, and they fell into that mess, hook, line, and sinker. And yet those are the same people who for decades have decried Mormonism, have decried Jehovah's Witnessism, have decried Seventh-day Adventism, have decried all kinds of cults. But when a cult came along that appealed to their own logic and their own reasoning and their own thinking all of a sudden guess what all of a sudden 
They got a sale. Oh, we made a sale because we'll buy into this because this sounds good to me. Uh, there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is destruction. Anything that anybody that can look, and I'm going to say it plain today, anybody that can look at Donald Trump and believe for one second that demon is a Christian is an idiot. It's the biggest bloody idiot on the planet. There is not a thing in that man's life. There is not one single thing that I have ever seen uttered from that man's lips. I've never seen an action committed by him. I have never seen, heard anything that would even begin to suggest to me that he was a sincere lover of Jesus Christ and follower of the gospel of Christ. I've, I've never seen or heard anything. So if you can buy into that, sweetheart, you're wearing blinders that were sold to you by a spirit of deception. The primary spirit that works with religious spirits is the spirit of deception. If a religious person can be convinced of a lie, they can be eternally lost. Listen. While all the while falsely believing that all is well with their soul. Now what do you think of that? If you could convince a religious person to believe a lie, they can be lost and headed for hell and the whole time think that they're on their way to heaven and all is well with their soul. And that is accomplished through a spirit of deception. Deception is powerful, but it must be embraced. Anyone with a sincere desire for truth is assured by God in his word that they will find the truth. Hebrews 11 and 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Diligently, another word that can be used here is sincerely seek him. Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? So as long as you approach God sincerely, God has promised you will get what you're asking for. But the moment you leave the door open, whether you leave it open because, well, but you know, I like the idea of there not being a hell. But, you know, the Jehovah's teach there is no hell, and that works better for me. I'm more comfortable with that. Uh, honey, you just left the door open for the influence of a spirit of deception. You don't want to do that. If the Word of God says it's there, then it's there, period. End of the story. Got news for you, children. Now, this preacher, I don't get up and preach hellfire and brimstone because the Word of God doesn't tell me to scare people into heaven. It tells me to help people love Jesus into heaven. So I'm, I don't get up and preach, quote-unquote, hellfire and brimstone all the time. But I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to tell you the truth. Hell's hot and heaven's real. I'm not going to stand there and tell you there is no hell. I've researched it. I've studied it. I know every I know every definition from the Greek and Hebrew from the term hell and blah, 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 and all the arguments that Jehovah's used. I'm well aware of all the arguments. Got news for you. You study the Word of God. You look into the original text. You see what it says. It's got news for you. There is a hell. You can try to explain it away all you want to. There is a hell. Rich man and Lazarus. The rich man was in hell. He was burning. He was in heat. He was in fire. Um, duh. 
Don't give me this foolishness of, well, but you know, Jesus was just using that as like a little parable, as a little, uh, well, isn't that funny that in his little parable, he spoke of a place that you claim doesn't exist. And he was there for the reasons that I understand people go there. Listen, Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 4, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say, and they do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Yes, demons operate within the realms of religion. He said, the scribes and Pharisees, their job is to represent the law of Moses. He said, therefore, when they're teaching you about the law of Moses, and they're telling you what the law of Moses said you ought to do, he said, do that. He said, but whatever you do, don't follow after the way they act. Because while they're all the while teaching you what you're supposed to do, they're doing completely the opposite. He said, so do what they say, not what they do. Do you follow? In Titus chapter 1, verses 7 through 11, Talking about the requirements of a pastor, the word of God said, For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now listen to what Titus says. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision or those within the Jewish community whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. They're charlatans. They teach what people want to hear for money. They're, they're in it for the money. And it's easier to preach what people want to... I could have this building filled up today were it not for the virus going around. We could have this church filled up in a flat minute. If I would ever just stop preaching the one God, Jesus' name, apostolic message, and being true to that message, and preaching Acts 2.38 salvation, and preaching that God expects His people to act right and live right, because after all, our primary responsibility is to be a light in a dark world. We're supposed to be leading people to Jesus, and we're not supposed to lead them simply by telling them how to get there. We're supposed to lead them by showing them how to get there. There. Hello now. Mm -hmm. We've had people leave this church over the years over and over and over again because I stand up and I refuse to compromise. I refuse to let down my guard and to go with the flow. Am I telling the truth today? Yes. Revelation 2 and 9, the Lord says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, he says in parentheses. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, but are not. Listen to this last phrase. But are the synagogue of Satan. You think demons don't work in the realms of religion? The Lord said, no, these people say they're Jews, but they're not. In reality, they're of the synagogue of Satan. I got news for you, honey. If you think Christian people who call themselves Christians, but they're not Christians, and I'm telling you they're not Christians, and if you think they can act like the devil, and they can be hateful, they can be homophobic, they can be xenophobic, they can be mean, they can be malicious, they can be nasty, they can hold grudges, uh, they can be violent, they can be all these things, and still be a child of God, and still be part of God's true church, you're an idiot. That's right. 
They cannot. They are not children of God. Just like the Lord said here. They say they're Jews, but they're not. They're of the synagogue of Satan. What did the Lord say? He said, you shall know them by their fruit. He didn't say, if their fruit's bad, well, no, they're good people. They're, they just have bad ways. No, that is one of the deceptions and one of the lies that Satan has been able to successfully inject into Christianity. And there are many people in the Christian world today who believe that foolishness. Somebody doesn't act like a Christian is supposed to act. Oh, but they're a Christian. No, they're not. No, they're not. Revelation 3 and 9, trying to hurry. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. So again, the Lord draws the parallel. He said, no. There, there are people who claim one thing, but they're living something different. He says, well, I got news for you. What they're living identifies who they really are, not what they're claiming. Mm -hmm. Revelation 2, verse 2, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And has found them liars. I'm going to tell you something. I can't stand preachers running around calling themselves apostles. I, I've talked about this in the past and I'm not going to go on about it today. But I despise preachers calling themselves apostles. I believe you can do an apostolic work. Meaning, I believe you can do a work that is akin to being an apostle. You know, it's, it's just slightly under being an apostle. But honey, the Word of God tells me that the city of heaven is going to have 12 foundations, and on the 12 foundations are the names of the 12 apostles. So you tell me how there can be more apostles, how there can be apostles in the modern age. Um, wait a minute, no. How, how is that possible? If there are 12 foundations, there are 12 names. The Bible said that uh, the God, that uh, the church of Jesus Christ is built upon the foundation of the apostles, the apostles and prophets. If there can be an apostle in the world today, that would put them in the same standing as the apostle Paul. That would put them in the same identical standing as the apostle uh, Matthew. Or that would put him in the same standing as the apostle John, which means that everything he writes and says and does should be able to be canonized in, in scripture. In effect, you follow what I'm saying? No, they are not apostles. You got to be very careful about falling for people who run around calling themselves apostles, and they are not. At the heart of a religious spirit is the spirit of deceit or the spirit of deception, unwillingness by insincere believers to hear and embrace sound doctrine and godly practice results in their inviting a spirit of deception to take hold in their lives. When a Christian justifies themselves in their prejudice, in their malice, their hatred, their jealousy, their covetousness, whatever the case might be, this results in a spirit of deception, convincing them that they are yet in line with God in spite of their unwillingness to embrace the truth of God in these areas. When they embrace this deception, they then become prey to a religious spirit, which suggests that their soul is in good standing and their conduct is consistent with Christian living, motivating them to act as destructively as possible pushing people away from the truth rather than drawing them to it as is supposed to be the case. First, uh, 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. 
and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. We were warned. Peter warned us. He told us. Sure did. He said, many will follow their pernicious ways. Many are going to follow their false teaching and their false doctrine. I'm going to go a little bit over time if you all will give me a little bit of leeway today because I have a few more scriptures I want to share with you and I want to get this out today. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 12, listen. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Listen, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness, had pleasure. I know people that call themselves Christians who are as hateful as anybody can be, who are as homophobic and mean-spirited and malicious and nasty as any human being can be. And they take pleasure in being that way. They see no conflict. They see nothing wrong with having a bad spirit, having a bad attitude, being hateful, being malicious, being uh, uh, violent even oftentimes. They see no conflict, Army, in being that way and claiming to be a child of God. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Oh, there are perils to religious spirits. There are dangers when you start playing footsies with religious spirits. Religious spirits operate first and foremost in the realms of deception. They love to make you believe something that is not so. There is, there is a reason the Word of God admonishes us to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. There's a reason. Look in the Old Testament. Read in the Old Testament. I, you know, I read my Bible every day. I've been reading lately, and uh, uh, I started out in Chronicles and Joshua. And man, I'm gonna tell you, the Lord over and 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 over again. He kept saying to the children of Israel that they were to love the Lord their God with everything they had. And as I'm reading it, I thought to myself, Lord, you sure did make that point a lot. You sure did drive that point home. But, you know, I'm preaching on the perils of religious spirits, and I'm trying to help people understand that when you approach God insincerely, you're in a dangerous place. If you approach the Christian, in faith insincerely if you're sincerely not willing to try to try now I'm not saying you're going to be perfect I'm not saying you're going to be able to walk on water but if you're not sincerely going to try to live according to what the word of God teaches us to live and to do what the word of God teaches us to do then you might as well just not even bother because insincerity only invites deception. Do you follow what I'm trying to tell you today? There's a reason the Word of God says, Seek ye first, seek ye first, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, meaning what? And doing things right, which is His way. Why? Why does that have to be at the highest priority in our life? Because that is the only thing that keeps these spirits at bay.
The only thing that will keep demonic spirits from finding an open door in your life is when you approach God sincerely, when you come to your faith sincerely, when you're not playing games with God. Honey, if you're going to play games with we've had people come to church, get up and testify, and boy, I mean, they put on quite the show during the testimony service. And then after church, we're giving them a ride home. Remember, Booby? We're giving them a ride home in the car. And hearing that person talk, they sound, God forgive me, they sound as hood and as trash and as garbage as any hoodwink thing I've ever heard in my life. Am I telling the truth? You know what I'm talking about. Some of you out there watching, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. You... You know people like that. Oh, in church they put on a good show, and then the minute they go, well, I tell you what, she thought she's going to talk to me that way. I, tell, I just tore off my wig, and I mean, I got my shoes on my feet, and I was ready to go, honey. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I see. Better be careful about serving God with anything less than sincerity. Mark 12, 28 through 30, and one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, meaning asked Jesus, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Why is that the first commandment? Because the Lord knows that if you approach your walk with God that way, you will slam the door in the face of every demonic influence that would ever try to get near you. They're in, a, they're in a lying doctrine. They're in a lying devil in hell that will be able to touch you if you sincerely approach your walk with God sincerely and with all your might. People wonder, I mean, you know, people think, Pastor Charles, uh, you know, uh, honey, if you think that my faith is just what I do on Sunday, you don't know me very well. You know, I'm, I'm not claiming to be perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Don't, don't joke, don't kid yourself. I've got my faults, I've got my weaknesses, I've got my failings. But Tommy will tell you, I love the Lord and I love this gospel and I, I sing every day, I pray every day, I seek God every day, I read the Word of God every day. Not because I'm obsessed with it, not because I have some religious spirit in me. No, I love the Lord. I, you know, I was telling Tommy the other day, I said I was reading my Bible uh, the other day. I started reading, uh, I don't know where I, I started at. I think it was somewhere, in the, it was in the New Testament and I, I, one of the epistles, you know. Well, anyway, and I was enjoying it so much, and I got into it so much. I told Tommy later, I said, all of a sudden, I, I put down my Bible, and I looked, and I said, my God, I'm up to Revelation chapter 13. And I started out several epistles before Revelation, <laughs> you know. I done read through you know, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, I read through Peter. I mean, I literally had read through complete, you know, epistles. And But I love the Word of God. I love the I get to reading the Word of God sometimes, and I just get so enamored with it that I can't stop. I just keep going and keep going. I'll tell you, God knows my heart. If there's anything, if there's anything about me, I may not be perfect, but I'm sincere. I may not be perfect, but I'm sincere. Mm -hmm. My faith is sincere. Anybody who knows me has to know that my faith is sincere. Two more scriptures. Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 17. And it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in His due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil, and I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. 
Take heed to yourselves. Listen to what the Lord says in Deuteronomy 11. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived. And ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you. And he shut up the heaven, and there be no rain, and the land yield not her fruit, and lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Lastly, this message, Galatians 6, 7, and 8, be not deceived. You'll notice that word, deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. This message I've titled today, The Perils of Religious Spirits. But in reality, the, the foundation of the message today is this. Folks, serve the Lord sincerely. Don't play games with God. Don't, don't be goofing around and messing around. Don't read the Word of God and just because that doesn't suit you, toss it aside and think that it's okay that you can still act the way you want to act. You can still think the way you want to think. You can still behave the way you want to behave. And all will be well with your soul. And it's not because the Word of God says it's okay, but rather because you're just not comfortable with that, so therefore you want to push it aside. Don't do that. You, when you do that, you're opening the door to a spirit of deception. And deception is what loves to work in the realms of the religious. Loves to work in the realms of the spiritual. Loves to make people believe that all is well with God and everything's going to be fine. And the Lord said, no, as long as you love me with everything you've got, as long as you approach me and you serve me sincerely, he said, I'm going to bless everything you do and everything is going to go well. But the minute that changes, hello now, so does the outcome. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is destruction. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Come on, let's make up our minds. Are we going to live for God? You know, th this is why Grace Oasis Ministries, I've been doing this now since 1993. I've been preaching, trying to do a restorative work in the LGBT community since 1993. And there's a reason why my churches that I've tried to build, that things I've tried to do don't grow and don't, prosper. I'm not foolish. I'm not listen. I'm not crazy. I know good and bloody well what the reason is. I know. You think the enemy hasn't whispered in my ear, hey, if you'd lay off that Jesus name stuff, if you'd lay off that oneness stuff, if you'd lay off that Acts 238 stuff, I'm going to tell you early, early in my affirming ministry, long before I met Tommy, when I was still in New York City trying to do a work for the Lord, the enemy come whispering in my ear. And I'm telling you, it was so vivid, it was so clear. And I slammed that door in his face. And I said, Devil, unto whom much is given, much is required. To him that knoweth to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. Said, I got news for you. I realized MCC was founded by a man who was supposed to have been full of the Holy Ghost, supposed to be a Pentecostal preacher, supposed to know what the power of God in his life was, and he created an organization that became a hybrid of everything from Roman Catholic to Buddhist. Um, I'm not going to do that, devil, because I know what I believe. I know what God showed me. I know the revelation of Jesus' name. I know the revelation of the oneness of God. I know that Acts 2.38 is the way of salvation. I know that the baptism of the Holy Ghost for the initial evidence of speaking with other tongues is real. I know the only way to go down in the water is in the name of Jesus, and I'll be hell bound on a glory train before I'm ever going to compromise what I 
know to be true. I'm going to preach what God showed me. I'm going to preach what God's revealed to me. I'm not going to compromise it. And if my church never fills up with a single soul, at least... My Ooh, glory. At least when I stand before God one day, He's going to be able to look at me and know, Son, you never one time compromised your message in order to fill up your church. And I'm committed to that. And I'm preaching now, and God's given us an, an internet ministry, which I never dreamed of. I never thought we'd you know, be doing what we're doing today. But we're doing it. So we may not have the biggest church in Dallas, but I'll tell you what, we're preaching the truth of God that is able to save your soul and set you free. And we're preaching it to people all over the world. I get letters sometimes, emails, from people all the way on the other side of the planet. I told you before, I'm closing right now. We got a message one time years ago. I got it in the snail mail through the U.S. Postal Service. A lady living in the Arab world. She said, I have been following your ministry online now. I, I don't know if back then, I don't think we were doing videos yet. I think it was just the uh, audio of our sermons that we were sharing online. She said, I've been following your ministry and listening to your preaching. She said, well, one night I had a dream. And in my dream, she said, I saw Jesus. She said, well, I was raised... A Muslim, she said, so seeing Jesus was really no big thing to me, she said, because we look at him as a prophet and, you know, a good man and everything. We don't hold him in the same regard as we do Muhammad, you know, but he's a good guy. She said, so I didn't really think much of it. She said, but he came over to me and he said, I am Jesus. I am God. <laughs> She said, well, I just wanted to write and tell you that you've been instrumental in helping me to find this doctrine and find this truth. She said, I'm living now, and I can't remember the country. It was up in the Nordic region, like Sweden or something like that, or, or, or Norway or something. She said, I'm living now in, in one of these countries. She said, I'm part of a, a, a church up here that preaches this gospel. And I wanted to let you know you were influenced you were influential in this. Folks, I'm telling you, I don't even know who our ministry touches. I don't even know. Sometimes I hear from people, and they tell me, I've been following you for five years. I've been following you. Know, and we never heard a peep from them in all that time. But I'm going to tell you, I know the message to preach, and I'm not about to open the door to the devil by compromising and being insincere in my walk with God. No, I want to hear those words. Well done, my faithful servant. Amen. Amen. Praise God. There are perils in the realms of religious spirits. Be not deceived. Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon?